Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Swindon Spring Festival. Um, well, actually the Swindon Spring Virtual Festival in May 2020. That's the way it is this year. Um, thanks very much for joining us online. Um, we do hope that all is well where you are. COVID-19 restrictions prevent us from putting on live events, but we are pleased that at least online in a virtual way, the show goes on. That's very important to us. And in this particular session, we're very pleased to welcome the author of From What Is to What If, a timely book if ever there was one, and a book that not only has a fantastic title, but it also has a fantastic contents page, which is a series of questions. There's something so great about questions. Um, it also has notes at the end, very helpful notes. It also has an index, a fabulous index, and it also has scores of acknowledgements, which all in all says this is a proper book. And, and uh, as a festival organiser, I really like that when we come across a proper book, a really helpful and thorough book. So we're very pleased about that. In a moment, our guest author will answer an introductory question or two, um, and then talk about his book for a while. And in the closing session, he'll have a chat with me and answer a few more questions. Okay, so now please join me in giving a virtual but sincerely meant and a real Swindon Spring Festival welcome to writer, speaker, founder of Good Things, gardener, parent, and a man who even finds time to create beautiful drawings. Rob Hopkins, welcome. Thank you. Hello. Very nice to meet you. It's very nice that you're here. And um, Rob, it's a shame you can't be here, can't come to Swindon, can't come to Lower Shore Farm, the headquarters of the Swindon Spring Festival. Um, it's a pity we can't see you here, but uh, that sort of begs the question, have you ever been to Swindon before? Do you know, I actually grew up, uh, a part of my childhood was lived near Swindon. Uh, I lived for a while in Ogbourne, St. George. Uh, my sister lives in Swindon with her, with her family. And uh, between the ages of 12 and 13, I used to go and watch Swindon Town Football Club on a fairly regular basis. I think I only ever actually saw them win once. They were pretty dreadful at that time, but it was my, my experience of going to big football matches. And, uh, and uh, when I was 12, 13, uh, I thought of nothing more highly in life than a, than a Saturday afternoon spent uh, wandering around the record shops of Swindon. Oh, Rob, that, that that makes you one of us. That's a really nice feeling. Um, well, that's that comes as a real surprise, bearing in mind that you come from that lovely part of Devon. Um, uh, and, and Totnes is not quite like Swindon. Um, okay. It's not quite like Swindon, no. No. Um, uh, but but, it, but it, 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 it is sort of like I lived, uh, I used to go to... If, if I say I went to school in Marlborough, it makes me sound terribly grand. I actually went to the comprehensive down the other end of town. And uh, uh, but uh, so so for us, Swindon was like the big city yeah. and a very, very exciting place to go on the Saturday. Yeah, no. And, and Ogborn St. George is just outside. And I come from Purton, which is also just outside Swindon. But just okay. like you, Swindon was the big place to go to, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, exactly. Rob, before you tell us about your book, um, I'd just like to ask you one more question. In your in your introductory pages, um, you go off on a fantasy, which is wonderful. It just draws you into the book and you go on to this fantasy of how the world might be. And you end that section with this line. I settle down to sleep with the feeling that the future is rich with possibility, rich with possibility. Um, that was probably written last year. Um, do you still feel that now, not only in view of the virus, pandemic but also how things have moved on uh, I do I actually feel more so actually I, I I was reflecting on it today that you know there's a there's an exercise that I do when I do big groups uh, and big conferences where uh, I invite people to imagine that we are stepping into a time machine and that we are traveling forward to 2030 and we're not traveling to a utopia we're, but we're traveling to a 2030 where in those 10 years between now and then everything that could possibly have been done was done but it was a time of profound social shift transformation uh, it was a time when we saw this kind of building cascade of positive change happening through society and actually uh, uh, 
and, and then I invite people to imagine themselves walking around in the future. And the things people always say, and I've done this now many, many times, the things that people always say are, there's, there's, there's no cars, there's very few cars, uh, I can hear the bird song really loudly, the air smells really, really clean, smells really, really fresh, uh, people are growing food uh, everywhere I walk past. That's an awful lot easier to imagine over the last three or four weeks than it was a few months ago. You know, we can, if we step outside our front door and go for a walk around nowadays, although of course, you know, it's, it's certainly not in the, the, the route to that kind of change that anybody wanted to see. And it's not for a moment to, you know, devalue or downplay any of the suffering that has accompanied it. But what we're seeing around the world now is, uh, is, is things that we were told were completely impossible. Improvements in air quality, reductions in car use, reductions in air use, uh, um, a degree of sort of people coming together and supporting each other that people didn't believe was necessarily possible. So actually my sense is that we get to the end of this whenever that happens. And then I think the really interesting conversations will be about what of this do we keep? Actually, you know, in Milan now they're saying, okay, so we've seen that there's a huge reduction in cars coming into the center of Milan. So we're going to use this as the opportunity to put in 22 miles of bike paths and to pedestrianize great areas of the city. You know, we move forward from here. We always used to talk about how resilience was about how you, how you bounce back after shock. For me, it's about how we bounce forward. And I think that actually where we are now, you know, when people have gone to, to living in London where you can breathe the air really, really clean in a city that loses thousands of people from air pollution every year, I think we're, I think we're in a stronger place actually in some ways. So would you like me to talk about the book now? <laughs> um, that's, that would be great. Um, you've answered that question thoroughly. Okay. Thank you very much, Rob. Okay, so this is the book. And uh, as well as having all the lovely things uh, that Matt described earlier in terms of appendices and stuff, it also has two covers, which I'm rather fond of. You take the outer cover off, you get an, an inner cover. So I, I wrote this book. Uh, I spent the last couple of years researching and writing this book because uh, my background is I've been a, a, a climate activist for a long time. I started the Transition Town movement, which is about what can communities do, what's their role in, in kickstarting a, a really deep transition, always underpinned by the idea that the, that the challenge of the climate crisis goes far beyond the idea that we just put some solar panels up and switch to organic carrots. It's a profound uh, shift that we need to see, as Naomi Klein says so beautifully, there are no non-radical solutions left. And I kept reading people like Naomi and Bill McKibben and people like this who I really admire, George Monbiot, people like that, who would say, climate change is a failure of the imagination. I kept coming across this expression, climate change is a failure of the imagination. And it always left me thinking, what does that mean? Why would we be having a failure of the imagination at, at this crucial point in our evolution? Why would it be that, that our, surely our imaginative capacity should be really robust? We are, you know, we're so good at so many different things. Why would it be that at this crucial time when climate change demands that we reimagine and rebuild so many things that our imaginative capacity might not be up to it? And so I kind of embarked on this journey and quite soon I came across some research by a woman called Kyung Hee Kim, who was a researcher in the US. It was published in 2010 called The Creativity Crisis, where she looked at um, this thing called the Torrance Test for Creative Thinking, which is the kind of gold standard creativity test. Then she had big data sets of this going back to the early 1960s. And her analysis was that, uh, that, that imagination and IQ rose together until the mid 90s. And then IQ kept rising and imagination started to go into what she called a steady and persistent decline. And when this was published, it was a really big story in the US. It made the front page of Newsweek. They said, what does this mean for economic growth? What does this mean for Hollywood and Pixar? But I never heard anyone in the social justice, climate change, social equity world say, what does this mean for us? Because if we're losing the ability to imagine things in a different way. John Dewey described imagination as the ability to see things as if they could be otherwise. And if there was ever a time we needed the ability to see things as if they could be otherwise, it's now. 
because business as usual or the normal that people talk about after this virus, they hope we get back to normal. That kind of business as usual is, is a suicide pact in effect from a climate perspective. It's been ecologically catastrophic. We've lost 60% of all the creatures we share this planet with since the 1960s. So this is a time that calls for really bold, fresh thinking, new ideas. Uh, and actually one of the things, as I mentioned before, about the coronavirus that has been so fascinating these few weeks for me has been how many things we were told were impossible and that we were completely naive dreamers forever imagining that they were possible have come to be just, you know, when we decide to do things, of course we can do them. And when people bought into Margaret, when Margaret Thatcher said in the 1980s, there is no alternative, I feel like those words lodged deep into our collective psyche. But of course there's an alter alternative. There has to be an alternative. So this book set me out uh, going around trying to find places where I could see uh, that imagination was being rebuilt and valued and cherished. Uh, I started out by uh, looking at play and asking, you know, what if play was part of our everyday life? You know, we've seen this kind of purging of play from the streets of our, of, of, of our towns and cities. It used to be our streets were full of children playing. The former mayor of Bogota used to say that we should see the number of children playing in our streets as being a key well-being indicator for that city. But actually, we've kind of purged that and got rid of that as we sort of expect our children now to start compiling their CV from the age of four. So I went to go and visit a street in Bristol where they were intentionally bringing play back, this fantastic scheme called Playing Out. I visited a thing in my own town here in Totnes called the, the, the Festival of Street Games, where we closed a square and kids could come and play. Uh, and I write about a project that we did through Transition, an amazing activity that was developed called Transition Town Anywhere, where a group of adults come together, two or three hundred, in a big hall, and you imagine that you're stepping forward into a future that works, where everything that could have been done has been done, and then you build it out of cardboard and bamboo canes and sticky tape and string, and you build this three-dimensional future that you then live in and inhabit, and trade in, and uh, educate in and build things in uh, to see three or four hundred adults completely lost in play and, and imagining the future in a different way is really magical. I wondered what if we considered mental uh, imagination vital to our health and well-being and went to visit an amazing project in Scotland in Dundee called Art Angel that works with people who have mental health problems or stress or anxiety or burnout and they use art as the way to bring people back again. They say, when you walk through the door here, you're not a patient or a client, you're an artist who is preparing work for an exhibition. And every year they put on a big exhibition in one of the big art galleries in Dundee. And, uh, and I spoke to so many people there who talk, talked about how this space had given them the ability to see the future again. Because one of the things I think that happens when our imagination shrinks is that, we, is that we start to lose that ability to see the future in hopeful and positive ways. And I came to think that actually, Imagination has certain needs. So we all know in our own life that the time when we're at our most imaginative is when we have space, when we have some space in our life. Albert, Albert Einstein always said his best ideas came to him when he was riding his bicycle under the trees. There's a mathematician I talk about in the book who talks about his 3B mantra, that his best insights come when he's either in bed, in the bath, or, or on the bus. Uh, you know, we need to create the conditions for the imagination. It needs us to have our basic needs on, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs met. So there is an element of privilege that, 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 that goes along with imagination. And when we have, uh, uh, when we've lived through now 12 years of imposed austerity, I think in many ways as a society, we are creating the perfect conditions, a kind of perfect storm of factors that reduce our imagination. Uh, and so I, I look at uh, the role of nature that of course, nature is central to most great imaginative people in our culture's lives, poets, painters or whatever. But we spend less and less time in nature, less and less time outdoors. And we now see doctors who are prescribing people nature connection uh, as part of what they're doing. Uh, I look at the role of, the, of our attention span, our declining attention span and the links between attention and imagination. And that when we live in a time when our collective imagination span is shrinking and contracting, how hard that is then to, to be able to sustain. Uh, sorry, I'm like that guy on the BBC when, the, when his children 
I come running into the room. That was my dog. Um, uh, what was I? Yeah. So when our attention span shrinks and contracts, our imagination shrinks with it. And uh, and when we're living in a time, I think, when our imagination, our attention span is under a really unprecedented uh, amount of distractions and we're forever, we are forever elsewhere, as one person I interviewed put it. Uh, I look at school and the role of education. And, and I have to say, as somebody who has written books about climate change and done a lot of research on climate science, researching the state of health of imagination in our education system in 2020 was heartbreaking. And people I spoke to who were teachers who talked about how there was just no room for it at all, uh, that it's so much now about passing tests and exams and so on and so on. And, um, uh, and, I, and then I talked to people all around the world who were starting education projects, which put imagination at the heart of them. And some of those are new schools, some of those are people who go into schools, some of those are sort of centres within existing schools, some of those are people who are doing without school altogether. But the things that a lot of those have in common is the idea that we learn not from subjects, but learning through projects, that we have making at the heart of what we do, uh, that we have play as a fundamental that runs through it. And this kind of redreaming of what education should be so that young people leave school at the age of 18 with their imagination honed like a superpower feels like the most uh, the most powerful uh, an important thing that we can be doing with our education system. I talk about storytelling, which of course is something that runs through uh, a literature and arts and ideas festival. The idea that we need to become the best storytellers we can be. How in every conversation that we have with people about the state of the world, about climate change and so on, do we, br do we bring in our ability to tell stories about the future that we could still create? How do we bring that to life through drawing, through literature, through animation? Uh, we, we are surrounded by dystopian novels in which we are either finished off by natural catastrophes or zombies or gremlins or pandemics or asteroids from outer space or, or Klingons or whatever. And very, very rarely do we ever see the stories of, a, of people who were faced with a, with a problem like this and got together and did something about it. And uh, that's not to say we need to make sort of fantasy utopia films. But we need to tell stories about what it looks like when ordinary people come together and create extraordinary things. And again, the thing that is one of the things that is most fascinating about this uh, lockdown at the moment is the number of those stories that we're creating. Of if we, if, be if we believed the Hollywood disaster films, by now we would all be out looting and eating each other. And actually what we're seeing is the most phenomenal upsurge of community connection people looking out for each other, people caring for each other. And, uh, and that's something that we had been almost convinced didn't exist anymore. But actually it's now a fundamental part of our story. And then the bit of the book is about how do we become really good at asking what if questions? I think those two words are the most important words in our language right now, what if? And I visit different projects around the country, around the world where they are asking a really great what if question. And uh, one of those that I just love is from Liège in Belgium, where Liège en transition started a project called the Food Belt, Centure Alimentaire. And they started with a what if question, which was what if in a generation's time, the majority of food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège? Such a beautiful, beautiful, simple question. And I went there four years ago. They were just starting to ask that question. I went to an event with chefs and baristas and artists and, and academics and farmers. I went back last year and they'd created 21 cooperatives. They'd raised 5 million euros of investment from local people. They'd created a vineyard, two, uh, two vineyards, a farm, a brewery, four shops in the center of the city, which just seemed to be expanding, new ones added every month, uh, distribution businesses, a local currency. I met the mayor of the city who said, this is now the story of our city. Our role as a municipality is just to get out of the way. They're now looking at universities and schools and hospitals and how they get involved in the scheme. You could see, sparked by that what if question, a city reimagining its food system in a way that the, the, that the mayor said to me eight years ago, we used to say we wanted to be a smart city. Now we want to be a transition city. This is now our story as a city. And there are many different what if stories that I tell in the book, which are stories about people. Uh, mobilizing around a really simple uh, what if question. And then I talk about, well, what if we had leaders who could prioritize the cultivation of imagination, which is a particularly difficult question in the UK uh, in 2020. But what I mean by that is how would it be if 
if we recognize that we are living in a time of uh, kind of imaginative contraction and the muscle that should be like that is in fact like that for a variety of reasons and we have had we have had 10 or 20 years of politics and economics and democratic decisions that have led to us li living in this kind of perfect storm of imaginative contraction how do we start to reverse that and i talk about you know what a different democratic model would look like i talk about economic frameworks that might enable the imagination and even the idea of having a national imagination act a piece of legislation that would enshrine our right to an imaginative life which feels like an idea if we emerge from the other end of the coronavirus with one idea in mind for me this idea of having a national imagination that feels like a vital vital part of this and then the last bit of the book really is is about what if this all came to pass what would it be like to live through a time when anything felt possible and that's almost outside of our experience but i look back through history and try and find places and projects that uh, that, that, that embody that that sense of uh, of anything being possible so i'm just going to finish off just with a little bit uh, just to read you a little passage out of the book so um just to introduce two of the characters that i mentioned here one of them is a woman called gabriela gomez mont who works for the mayor of mexico city where she has created what is in effect a ministry of imagination which some, sounds like something out of a harry potter book but in mexico city they have a ministry of imagination and uh, uh and then the other woman is called kyung hee kim who is the woman who wrote that creativity crisis paper which i mentioned at the beginning so this is a little bit from near the end of the book I believe, as Gabriela Gomez Mont put it, that imagination is not a luxury. If Kyung Hee Kim is right, and our imagination has been declining since the mid 1990s, it at least partially explains what we are seeing in the world today. As Dr. Peter Gray wrote in 2012, well, surprise, surprise, for several decades, we as a society have been suppressing children's creativity to ever greater extents. And now we find that their creativity is declining. It wasn't as though some people didn't see this coming. We recognize that if a population isn't sufficiently nourished, we will see a decline in health and a rise in preventable illnesses. We recognize that if we fail to give a population a good education, it will fail to reach its potential. Yet the neglect of the imagination is generally overlooked, seen as a frivolous distraction from the overarching aim of building economic growth and technological progress. We saw in Reggio Emilia, which is a story in the book, an amazing education project in Italy, what the creation of a system of education designed specifically to prevent the resurgence of fascism would look like. Yet we have a decline, designed an education system, which is almost its opposite. We can see in Barcelona and other Spanish municipalist cities what a model of democracy that invites the imagination could look like. Yet in most other places, we persist in moving further and further away from such a thing. We saw at Artangel what an approach to mental health that puts safety, hope and imagination at its heart would look like, yet most people's experience is just the opposite. Our imagination isn't accidentally dwindling, it is being co-opted, suffocated, corrupted and starved of the oxygen it needs. We have relegated the imagination to the margins for too long. And now, as Robert Louis Stevenson put it, we sit down to a banquet of consequences. Our failure to create the conditions, the spaces, the opportunities and the invitations for the imagination and the implementation of political programs such as austerity directly smash to pieces much of what most of us need in order to live imaginative lives. We are living through a perfect storm of factors ruinous to the imagination. As we face vast crises that demand imaginative and urgent responses and a reimagining of everything, we are simply not up to it. This is really serious, which makes it all the more important to reprioritize it as rapidly and in as many ways and places as we can. Um, Rob, you've talked about your book. I love it. And um, you've done what writers for centuries are bound to do and are almost duty bound to do and I see it at the festival year after year and that is take words that have become sort of tired and cliched and reinvigorate them 
and get them going again. And I think you've got quite a task on your hand with imagination, a long Latinate word that is used in lots of ways and in the business world. I think it's a bit out of date now, but they say blue sky thinking. That's a kind of imaginative use of, of the brain power. Um, in schools, teachers, bless them, doing a, a terrific job. But when they say to children, use your imagination, what they usually mean is make things up almost, and you mentioned it, you said just now, almost like Harry Potter, but it's not quite Harry Potter because that's fantasy. And, and so the word imagination um, is, is well worn and is going to need quite a kick to get it to be, um, to, for there to be a National Imagination Act that is, that is somehow taken seriously. So I think you've really taken something on, um, <laughs> but I love it. Did, uh, what sort of progress have you made? Uh, well, the book's only been out a couple of months, and it hasn't been out very long. So, so I, I, uh, I'm still, uh, I'm still kind of in promoting it and getting it out there. What's been really interesting? Well, just to say what you what you were saying there about imagination. There's a lovely quote by Ursula Le Guin, who in the book, who really differentiates between creativity and imagination. And she said, uh, in the marketplace, the word creativity has come to mean the generation of ideas applicable to practical strategies to make larger profits. The reduction has gone on so long that the word creative can hardly be degraded further. I don't use it anymore, yielding it to capitalists and academics to abuse as they like, but they can't have imagination. <laughs> um, that's really she interesting. Great, she, she was one of the great defenders of the imagination. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> The word, the word creative has gone a little bit out of writing groups as well, I've noticed. They, they've kind of left the word creative behind and they just, they don't say creative writing groups, it's a writing group and, that, and that's enough because the, the, the word creative is a little bit sullied. Yeah, what, I mean, <clears throat> what I've seen since the book came out actually has been, mm. um, uh, has been lots and lots of people who compiled kind of, lots of people now who are on lockdown who are reading and who are finding it a really useful way of ordering their thoughts about what comes next and the process is about thinking where do we go from here i think it was also read a lot of people i know who are involved in extinction rebellion for whom that very kind of combative confrontational albeit non-direct and peaceful and, and beautifully done activism really takes a toll i think you know most people i know who were involved in the, the October or the April rebellions. It took them about two months to recover. And a lot of them, I think, found the, the, a lot of the ideas in there very, very useful. Um, uh, the mayor of Paris um, uh, wrote an endorsement for the book. And I noticed that she, when she was running for the, for the elections that were supposed to be last month, which were canceled, but when she launched her election campaign, she gave a beautiful speech, which could have been straight out of this book, <clears throat> where she talked about she didn't talk about this is a climate emergency and we need to do things because otherwise we're all going to die or anything. She gave this beautiful storytelling piece about Paris as a 15 minute city. And I want Paris to be a city where you can walk to everything you need is within 15 minutes walk from where you live. And that includes food being grown and the air will be clean. She told this beautiful piece of storytelling. Uh, the book is about to come out in France uh, in about two months as well, if the French edition and other ones coming along behind. Uh, and what I've seen most has been people's kind of comments and reflections on social media and the way that I've seen imagination woven much, much more into debates and discussions about what activism looks like going forward for me. Okay, <clears throat> you've just mentioned Paris there and, and that's a question I want to ask because a number of times in your book and much as I like it, I need to sort of ask a question of the kind that a festival follower here in an industrial town or more computer town now, Swindon, like many towns in the UK, would ask you. Good, um, good. And, and they would say something like this. Hey, Rob, you say, listen to a dawn chorus. You say, grow locally. You say, you're almost saying kind of Schumacher stuff, small is beautiful, things like that. Um, look at history. Um, empires, Roman empires, Aztec empires, Incas, Habsburgs, um, London, everything comes, there's a human tendency to come together in big urban sprawls. 
And then the other thing that human beings seem to be very keen on is advancing technology, all the time advancing technology. So here we are in this town. How can we do things the way you're advocating? Is there not a contradiction there? No, I don't think there's a contradiction at all. I think, I think wherever we are, whether we are in Totnes, whether we are in Manchester, whether we're in Swindon or whether we're in Sao Paulo, we have to figure out a way uh, to adapt to this emergency that we're in. And, and, and uh, as a, you know, Extinction Rebellion would always say, tell the truth, you know, as, as my little tell the truth contribution, you know, we are living in a time where if we carry on as we are now, within 10 years, we pass one and a half degrees. Uh, within another 10 years, we have passed two and a half degrees. Between one and a half to two and two and a half degrees, we start to see the collapse of, of the global, uh, of, of the sort of grain baskets around the world. Uh, you know, by it's, it's a absolutely catastrophic. And if we want to stay below one and a half degrees, that means we need to start making cuts of eight, nine, ten percent a year, starting right now. And uh, what does that mean for Swindon? That's really that's not for me to say. Uh, it's it's for people in Swindon to to, to kind of figure that out. And the, the point that I make in the book is the beautiful thing about imagination is <clears throat> that it thrives when we put limits around. Any writer will tell you, you know, if I said, you know, tell me a story, Matt, tell me a story now. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'll need to think about that. If I said, tell me about a story that lives uh, under the under the piano in your local pub. Uh, who's called David or whatever or something, you know, I give you some limits around that story then you're off and your imagination is why we love haikus and limericks and why Dr Seuss wrote a book with 50 words that when we put limits around something we're able to be more imaginative and what I see again and again whether, whether I visit villages, towns, cities universities, places where, where transitional things like it are happening that actually it's the people who are recognising the limits who are coming up with the most imaginative responses. If you're someone like Donald Trump, who doesn't imagine that there are any limits to anything, mm -hmm. the responses you come up with are profoundly lacking in any kind of imagination uh, about where we go from here. Swindon, I imagine Swindon, if, if Swindon had to cut its emissions by 10% a year, you'd be looking at, well, how do we make its housing stock as energy efficient as possible? How do we make sure that any new homes that are built don't require any space heating at all? How do we have such a good public transport system that nobody needs a car because you can get around the city so beautifully? How do we look at green spaces and, and, and open spaces and, uh, and to grow food? And how do we connect the city better with the land around it like they're doing in Liège? What would Swindon look like if it had a food belt that fed the city? How would it look if we said, okay, we're going to look at reducing cars uh, in the city because we have such a great public health uh, public transport system and we're going to look at bringing urban agriculture and, and beautiful food gardens into the center of our city as a mental health strategy as a public health strategy we're going to look at all of this stuff together we're going to look at said and saying every strategy that we bring in uh, to mitigate climate change in the city has to perform benefits that, that that improve the lives of the of the most disadvantaged people in this city uh, you know, th that's the kind of way that uh, the way I look at it and to say that we should be looking at strategies which are win, 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 win strategies. Here. I visited an amazing place in France a little while ago called Montsartu, uh, a town smaller than Swindon, but they were one of the things they were doing there was uh, that 70 percent of the food grown in all the schools uh, in the town was grown in a market garden that was started by the, the local municipality. Absolutely brilliant, and it and it was uh, and that's something that could work absolutely anywhere. And what they found was once they had done that, it led to all kinds of other behaviour change and shifting consumption patterns among families and children and so on. You know, we need to look at this holistically. It's not just about saying Swindon, you need to you know I don't know uh, put up a big wind turbine or something. You know, this is something that is really holistic and pulls all the different things together. And we, you know, Swindon is 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 a, a sort of a leader in many ways in terms of generating ideas and, and, and te in te technological innovation. You know, it could it needs to apply that same thinking. So Swindon could be the Silicon Valley of community resilience and uh, imaginative uh, for planning for the future. There are, there are people in Swindon who would love to hear that, Rob. And, and you're right. I mean, there are many towns like Swindon that are doing great things. Our council has all sorts of ideas 
and there are local groups who have ideas. It's brilliant. But there's a woman in, in the back row here. She's a philosopher by profession. And she says, could you ask Rob Hopkins the following question? Um, um, it, it, she loves your positivity and, and she loves your book, but she says, all the time I was reading it, I was thinking of human nature. So for example, the idea of saying, it's more convenient and it's more ecological to share transport. But human beings look at the way men and women love the bubble of their own car. That moment, even away from their family, in their car, they have their music, they drive in the direction they want to. There's, a, there's an example of human nature at work. It is both communal and, well, nasty people would say selfish, other people would say individual. Um, do you not see any pitfalls there with the way human nature is? What I see is that we have allowed the creation of a culture and an economy which, which is uh, aimed more at creating pleasure than it is creating happiness. Mm -hmm. It's aimed at creating short-term reward, which is something that we'll pay for, but which is, but which is peripheral, but which is, what's the word, uh, ephemeral, and, uh, and then goes. It's not about creating long-term happiness, long-term mm -hmm. contentment. Uh, and actually, the, the exercise that I do with groups where I invite them to imagine themselves in the future, what's so fascinating about that for me is that they bypass the pleasure and they go straight to the contentment. No one ever says, uh, when I'm imagining the future in 2030, uh, well, the first thing is I've got a really great phone and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and there's a great new supermarket around the corner. It's so much more convenient. You know, actually what people talk about is bird song and conversation and community and conviviality and carnival and all of those things that are fundamentally uh, what matter to us as people but our current economic system keeps throwing all these kind of distractions in the way i think i would say to that philosopher in the back row that actually uh, these last four weeks turn that all mm. turn that completely on his head Absolutely. You know, four, four weeks ago, a lot of people would have agreed. Yeah. Yes, we are fundamentally selfish. Yes, we fundamentally, uh, there's no such thing as community. Even Boris Johnson the other day said, oh, as if it was some, a new occurrence to him. Oh, actually, there is such a thing as community. Yet yeah, we all knew that. And the fact that you didn't know that completely explains why you and your, and your government have been behaving in the way that you have. I think that we are fundamentally uh, uh, a good uh, uh, community-minded cooperative beings but we live in a world that makes that really really difficult it makes it really hard for people to do that when people are exhausted and they're having to work so hard and they're worrying about where their next paycheck's coming from and they're living out of a food bank and all that kind of thing you know we need to create the conditions it's all the the, the studies about universal basic income when people introduce a universal basic income which i think we should rename a universal imagination uh, um, uh, enhancer or something you know that, that, that when you take away that stress and that anxiety that is what which is what is most damaging to the imagination and you remove that you see a flowering of creativity and imagination people have the time and space uh, to, to, to be more creative and maybe they might use it to start a new business maybe they use, use it to do something else but I think people are only uh, selfish and uh, and work in that way because that's the create that's the conditions we create. All that science you do with rats, you put rats too many rats in a cage, they all start biting each other and being horrible to each other. If you create a different setting for them, they act, they act in a completely different way. Mm. So it's not our fundamental makeup; it's the 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 the, 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 the environment that we're put into. Yeah. And I mean, it's so true. And. Uh, uh, I actually knew I agreed with you and the woman in the back row just insisted that I ask that question. And I've seen it through organizing festivals, Rob, that um, when there's the opportunity to participate rather than just to consume, people just love the opportunity. And, and we've almost become a festival of ideas rather than just a festival of, idea, I, um, of literature or circus skills. People love sharing ideas. So I think imagination is, is just waiting to take off. And I want there to be a ministry of, of, uh, of imagination with, uh, with, a minister, with a minister called Rob Hopkins. But listen, just to end on, 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 on uh, we need to end. And, and, and I want to invite you back to Swindon. And maybe we can run something 
like a talk and a workshop where people can really input ideas, but maybe that's for next year's yeah. festival. Would you be interested yeah. in that? Um, and just to say, I, I just, just to say, I, uh, I saw that philosopher woman at the bar before. I thought yeah. she was going to be trouble. Yeah, <laughs> she, she's actually a very well-meaning person, but she, she always thinks it's important to. She calls it playing devil's advocate, but you know, people are yeah. like that. Are wonderful. Um, um, in the book, you tell a story about the Sultan's elephant uh, in 2006. This, this coming to London. This, this remarkable brief mm. event that came to London. And you also speak of, in a couple of places, you use the word awe and the role of a kind of awe and wonder. And uh, an author who preceded you at the festival called Patrick Curry wrote a book called Enchantment, which is all about these moments that are available to us in cities and in the countryside. It's not, it's not just rural, it's, it's everywhere. Um, um, is that a key part of how we can make things better, do you think? Yes, I, I, I yes, Rob. So we could stop. <laughs> okay. Well, in brief, in brief, I would say, yeah, I, I, yeah. I feel like we, we, we neglect magic, and I don't mean that in a Harry Potter sense. I mean, you know, I, we neglect that sense of things that that take our breath away and surprise us. And uh, one of the things that really I was fascinated by was that research about awe. That when people mm -hmm. experience awe. They're kinder. They're more compassionate. They look after each other more. And 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 how could we design more awe into everyday life? And it's one of one of the few regrets I have in my life is that I didn't get to see that Sultan's elephant thing, because because it so moved people. Uh, and uh, and I guess that bit of the book is really saying, how do we, how if if there is a if there is a different way that we can think about the future, if there is a way that we could imagine Swindon as a city which has cut its carbon footprint by eight, nine, ten percent every year, and every step it does that, it becomes a better place. It becomes a healthier place, a more connected place, a more delightful place, uh, a more biodiverse place. If we can imagine that, how can we give people kind of tastes of it now? How could we create kind of pop-ups tomorrow, how pop-up tomorrows? How could we take the, 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 the area in front of the train station and overnight just transform it into that? And it would stay there for a few days and then it would disappear again and pop up somewhere else in the center. So a place that you knew really well, you would walk past and you would do a double take. And all of a sudden uh, that place would be transformed into the Swindon of 2030 uh, in a way that was really uh, phenomenal. And that's in the book, I tell stories about different places where that happens. But that's bringing that element of awe into it, I think, feels really important that actually the, the, the world that we can create from now could be so much more delicious than what we live in today. It could be fantastic. And we forget that. And we forget that at our peril. And every conversation we have about the future of Swindon should include the possibility that Swindon could be the most fantastic place on earth, the new garden of Eden, uh, the most gorgeous, glorious place that, uh, that, that the future generations will tell great stories about and sing great songs about. Um, Rob, <laughs> that's tremendous. And, and Rob's book is absolutely full of inspirational stuff, stories, ideas, information. Um, you're seeing it here at the virtual Swindon Spring Festival um, of 2020. Um, Rob, we hope to see you in Swindon one day but many thanks from the Swindon Spring Festival. Thanks very much, Rob. My pleasure. Thank you so much. See you in person soon. Thank you for uh, watching this virtual session at the Swindon Spring Festival of Literature and the Arts 2020. We do hope you enjoyed it. And we also hope that you will join us for the rest of this virtual festival. Here for you are details of the author you have just watched, their book and our online information. Thank you very much for joining us and keep well till we meet again.